Lux presents Hollywood. Lever Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, bring you the Lux Radio Theater, starring John Hodiak and Lynn Barry in Somewhere in the Night. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. William Keeley. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Among the many aftermaths of war, one of the most haunting is the strange affliction of amnesia, which, as you know, is the total or partial loss of memory through shock or injury. Long after battle wounds have healed, men live on in a strange and lonely world, helpless, frightened, and bewildered, obsessed with only one idea, to recover their identity. Such is the keynote of our play tonight, from 20th Century Fox's recent screen hit, Somewhere in the Night. The story of a man who gropes for his identity, his right to live and love without fear, through a welter of incriminating clues. And the stars who bring you this unusual exciting drama are John Hodiak, playing his original screen role, and talented Lynn Barry, one of Hollywood's most lovely stars. And speaking of our lovely stars, I met this week an old friend of mine, Miss Gloria Bristol, a leading beauty specialist whose clients include many of our famous actresses. She told me that for years she'd recommended soap and water for complexion care. And knowing my position in this theater, she went on to say in all sincerity that Lux Toilet Soap was first upon her list. Well, we know that nine out of ten screen stars depend on Lux Soap for complexion care, but it was naturally gratifying to have this unsolicited approval from a beauty expert. On to our play, Act One of Somewhere in the Night, starring John Hodiak as George Taylor and Lynn Barry as Christy Smith. George Taylor. My name's not Taylor. My name is... My name. I don't know. I don't know who I am. From the medical records, United States Marines, Iwo Jima campaign. Name, George Taylor. Rank, private, first class. Injury sustained in action. Compound dislocation of right wrist with multiple fractures of carpal bones. Compound comminuted fractures of right mandible. Patient removed from medical aid station to Naval Hospital, Pearl Harbor. Patient unable to speak or write due to nature of injuries. Chances of full recovery, excellent. My hand in a cast and my jaw tied together with wires. Taylor, they called me, the nurses, the doctors. George Taylor. I wanted to scream that my name wasn't Taylor, that I didn't know who I was. But I was getting better. Soon I'd be able to speak again, to write. I had to remember who I was. And then came a day when I knew I didn't dare tell them. The day they handed me my wallet. My wallet? Well, at least it had the name George Taylor on it. There were $80 in the wallet and a note. A girl's handwriting. These are my last words to you. I despise you and the memory of you. And I'll pray as long as I live someone or something to hurt you and make you want to die as you have me. No signature, no date, no address. Who writes things like that? Who do they write them to? Men they despise, whose memories they despise. The memory I didn't have. Soon I'd have to talk. If I told them I didn't remember, they would have started checking up. They'd have dug up that memory and thrown it in my face. I wouldn't let them know I couldn't remember. They'd get nothing out of me. Nothing. Nothing. That's the works, Taylor. From now on, you're a civilian. All your papers show you spent some time in the hospital. Jaw all right now? Your hand? Yes, I'm okay. They did a good job. Why? Well, you probably got a lot of questions. No questions. Well, that's a switch. But you'll dream up some. They all do. The Veterans Administration in Los Angeles will help you out. Uh, Los Angeles? Yes, that's where you're going, isn't it? Or has there been a change in your civilian address? 
Uh, no, no change. Say, I almost forgot. I got a surprise. You see, bag. It's finally been located. It may be a while before it gets here. I'll have one of the boys drop it off. Well, maybe I better pick it up myself. Why wait around? We'll have it delivered. Now let's see. Uh, George Taylor, Martin Hotel, Los Angeles. You'll be going back there, won't you? Martin Hotel. Yeah. Well, good luck, Taylor. Thank you, Sergeant. So I went to Los Angeles, to the Martin Hotel. If George Taylor had lived there, they'd know something about him. But they didn't. Oh, I'm sorry, son. No, George Taylor's been registered here in the last five years. What's the matter? Don't you feel well? Oh, yeah, sure, I'm okay. I guess I just made a mistake. No, I don't suppose you've got a vacancy, have you? For a Marine, sure, we got a vacancy. Any baggage? Well, uh, they'll be dropping off on a sea bag in a day or two. Fine. Oh, well, here's your room key, number 616. Oh, much obliged. Oh, your name, sir. The name? Taylor, George Taylor. But you... Why, well, you said you... I thought you... My sea bag arrived the next morning. No, I should say, Taylor's sea bag. There was just one thing in it that could prove something. A baggage check from the check room at the railroad station. It turned out to be a briefcase left over three years ago. Contained just two articles, a gun and a letter. This time, the letter wasn't from a girl. It was from a man named Larry Cravat. And on the strength of the letter, I hurried over to the Second National Bank. Can I help you, sir? Well, yes, I'm George Taylor. I just got out of the Marines. I have an account here. I'd like some money. Yes, sir. Identification? Well, how about this letter? Read it. It's okay. I've deposited $5,000 in your name in the Gibney branch of the Second National Bank. This letter will identify you. Look me up when you come out. Your pal, Larry Cravat. Well... I, uh, uh... I'll be right back, sir. Oh, Mr. Adams... Well, what's the matter? Something wrong? If you'll just wait a minute. What for? I think Mr. Adams would like to ask you a few questions, sir. Why? I don't get it. Well, he'll be right here, sir. Mr. Taylor, you're leaving? Please, Mr. Taylor, just a moment. They could ask all the questions they wanted, but not of me. Not until I had some better answers. The letter Cravat had written was on the stationery of the Elite Baths. It was my next stop, the Elite Baths. How would we know a guy named Larry Cravat? This place is a Turkish bath. But he wrote this letter on your stationery. Maybe he worked here. Sorry. I never heard of no Larry Cravat. Well, look, just in case he should come in, tell him to get in touch with me, will you? It's very important. George Taylor at the Martin Hotel. Maybe you want to try around the corner. What's around the corner? Out of a nightclub. It's called a cellar. Maybe I'll ask there about your pal. Well, thanks. I will. I went to the cellar that night. None of the waiters knew Cravat. Then I tried the bartender. He said he'd ask. There were two men at the end of the bar. I saw the bartender whispering to them. I didn't like their looks, so I started to leave. One of them cut me off. I crossed the dance floor, gained a little time, and ducked down a hallway into a dressing room. You forgot to knock, didn't you? Well, I can explain if you'll let me. Out. In a minute. Do you want me to start yelling? Don't, please. I'd have to stop you. I'd bet you'd try at that. Look, who owns this place? You barge into my dressing room to ask me that. I said who owns it. This and a half a dozen other spots around town are owned by a very nice guy named Mel Phillips. A lot of people on the payroll? Of course. Bus boys, waiters, cooks. Even alleged torch singers like me. And characters that sit around the bar waiting for me. Is that supposed to make sense? Don't open that door. Sorry, but I have to. In two minutes, a bouncer will be here with no sense of humor. And he's a foot bigger than you in all directions. There was a window next to her dressing table. As I started for it, I saw something on the table. A postcard. On one side was a girl's photograph. On the other side, a message. It was a message that made me put the card in my pocket. Christy Darling, it said. By the time you get this, I'll be Mrs. Larry Cravat. That'd make nice thinking back in my hotel room. Come in. Good evening. Do you happen to know when Larry will be back? Larry who? Larry, uh, Thompson. He's my uncle. He lives here in the hotel. 
Sorry, I don't know him. Oh, dear, I've been waiting 15 minutes. I uh, saw you get off the elevator, so So I, uh... you thought you'd drop in and be sociable. Ah, uh, this is exciting, isn't it? My name's Phyllis. Phyllis what? Uh, Phyllis. Uh, I see. Daughter of a rich, high-class family. Wouldn't want it known she waits around crummy hotel rooms for her uncle. Well, that's putting it a little crudely. I'll put it very crudely. You haven't been waiting around for anybody but me. Right to the point, aren't you? You want to know where Larry is? Yes. Except there isn't any Larry. It's just a name you made up to start me talking. About what? Oh, just this and that. I, I just thought that you ought to know about me, and I ought to know about you. I'll have to wait till I answer the phone. Hello? Mr. Taylor? That's right. This is the barkeep at the cellar. I got that information you wanted about a certain party. Cravat? Yeah, if you come down here, I can answer some questions. What? You can answer one right now. Who told you where to reach me? Just come down here. But I never told you where I lived. I... Hello? Hung up. That's right. <clears throat> Sorry to run out on your sister, but I got a date. Taylor? Yeah? Somebody wants to see you. There, in the car. How do you do, Mr. Taylor? Nice of you to come. I didn't come here to meet you. True, but I came here to meet you. Why? Get in a car. The bartender was paid to arrange this rendezvous. We have much to talk about. For instance? Are you being stubborn, Mr. Taylor, or just stupid? Larry Cravat, for instance. What about Cravat? Get in the car, we'll tell each other. I listen better where I am. No? Not stupid, just stubborn. All right, Hubert. Come in. Drive us home. Mr. Taylor, I should hate to have Hubert continue his beating. For the last time, where is Larry Cravat? I told you, I don't know. I'm looking for him, too. He's my friend. Larry Cravat has no friends. You are to stop looking for him, understand? You are to stop looking for him! Take him out of here, Hubert. Dump him someplace. Yeah? Where? Where? What was his address on a postcard photograph in his pocket? Oh, yes. 723 Gramercy. Maybe Miss Christy Smith wants to see him. Then he mentioned your name, Christy Smith. That's all I remember. I guess Hubert slugged me again. You feeling any better now, Mr. Uh, Mr. Taylor. George Taylor. Yeah, I'm okay. <laughs> you must be getting a little tired of me. First your dressing room, and now your apartment. Somebody rang the buzzer, I went to the door, and there you were. Well, why didn't you send for the cops? I'm considering it right now. I can't figure you out, Miss Smith. Well, you're not exactly an open book. Why did you steal Mary's picture? Because she's married to a man I'm looking for, Larry Cravat. Is she? Well, that's what she wrote on the card. Mary was my friend, Mr. Taylor. I went back east one Christmas, and while I was gone, I received three letters from Mary. In one letter, she had just met Cravat. In the second, she was in love with him. The third letter had that picture in it. That's the last I heard of Mary. Disappeared? When I got back to Los Angeles, I found out what happened. She waited three hours for Mr. Cravat at the license bureau in the city hall. He never showed up. That night, she didn't look where she was going when she crossed the street. She's dead, Mr. Taylor. Yes, I'd like to meet Larry Cravat someday myself. So are the boys in the back room. They don't believe I don't know where he is. Why do you want to meet him? I... I better go now. How far do you think you'd get? Not far. I'll be watching my hotel. Look, I'll go crazy if I don't talk to somebody. I'm somebody. What, what do you know about... Amnesia. Not much. You forget who you are or where you belong. You read about it in the newspaper, but it never happens to anyone you know. It happened to me. Six months ago, I woke up in a hospital tent. A complete blank. George Taylor, they called me. I couldn't talk. My jaw was in pieces. I, I couldn't write. My wrist was broken. How could I find out who I was? I nearly went nuts. Then I found a wallet with a letter in it. No signature. But it told me something about myself. It told me good. I was scared and I was sick. Sick at what the letter said I was like and scared of anybody finding it out. And so I kept my mouth shut, got my discharge. Then yesterday I found another letter. 
This one was from Larry Cravat. Said he was my pal. So I started looking for him. Well, you've got a rough idea of what's happened since. That's quite a pal you're looking for. I can't be choosy. It's like that joke about the crooked gambling house. He's the only one in town. So why don't I go find another town? Because you're full of questions and running away won't help. I know. I've got to find that guy, even if he's the heel of the world, because he knows about me. Keep on swinging. Something's got to break. Who's that? Maybe the break. Before you came to, I phoned Mel Phillips. Remember who he is? Your boss. That's right. Hello, Mel. Hello, Chris. What's the trouble? He's looking at you now. George Taylor. Hello, Taylor. He keeps falling through doors with me on the other side. I understand your trouble started in one of my places, Mr. Taylor. The cellar. You want to tell me what happened? It's all right. Forget it. But I'm sure Mel can help you. Well, maybe I can't. But you can help me, Taylor. You see, Chris, the police called me just after you did. One of my bartenders was found dead in a vacant lot. Which bartender? John. The one I talked to? He must have been. He was on duty when you visited my dressing room. I asked him if he knew a man I was looking for. After that, he set up those two characters who chased me into your room. Who is the man you were looking for? Her name's Larry Cravat. It's beginning to bore me. Cravat? I'm sure I know the name, but I can't seem to place it. What does he do? I don't know. Well, why are you looking for him? I just want to find him. Private reasons, huh? Well, now there are two of us looking for him. Maybe more. The police, maybe. Any reason why we can't ask the police? Yes, they might want to know who's asking and why. I've got a friend on the force, a Lieutenant Kendall. He'd keep it off the records. Well, thanks, just the same. Do what you can, though, will you, Mel? You know I will, Chris. That's my boy. Hey, look out. You'll have me believe in that. Oh, good night, baby. So long, Mr. Taylor. Good luck. Thanks. See you at the club tomorrow night. Thanks for coming, Mel. Sorry you didn't learn more. I've got good ears any time he feels like talking. Night. Well? He's a nice guy. That's the only kind I know. Except me. I'd better get going myself. You can't go. You can stay here if you want to. Here? My aunt lives upstairs. I can stay with her. <laughs> well, if there's any money or jewelry around, you better take it with you. I'm no good. Oh, I'll be sure to. Oh, it's no use. I'm licked, Christy. I can't play this alone anymore. I'm getting the jumps. I'll be hearing noises next. How soon can you get hold of Phillips again? I guess he's going straight home. A few minutes. Then phone him, will you? Tell him I'm ready to talk to that police lieutenant. In just a moment, we'll bring you Act Two of Somewhere in the Night, starring John Hodiak and Lynn Barry. Meanwhile, here's our Hollywood reporter, Libby Collins, with a new slant on picture making. Yes, Mr. Keeley. It's about 20th Century Fox's latest release, Boomerang. In producing the picture, the studio literally returned to the scene of the crime. You know, the story is based on a murder that actually occurred some years ago in Stamford, Connecticut. Mm -hmm. So the whole company went east. And for five nights, they worked from midnight till dawn on the main streets of Stamford. Mm -hmm. An interesting week for the residents. <laughs> well, it was quite a problem keeping them out of camera range. Lots of people went to bed right after dinner and slept till midnight in order to be on hand for the excitement. Dana Andrews, who has the starring role of the district attorney, told me it took considerable concentration to read his lines before an audience of thousands of fascinated spectators. I should think so. And Jane Wyatt, who plays Dana's wife, commuted from New York City to Connecticut every day, making trains at very odd hours. It was a strenuous life. You know, I'm eager to see Jane Wyatt in Boomerang. She's a really brilliant actress and a very handsome girl, too. Yes, she has a delicate, distinguished kind of beauty. She divides her time between the Broadway stage and Hollywood, so she really works pretty hard. And Mr. Kennedy, you'll be pleased to know that Jane's an ardent Lux girl. Says she depends on the gentle, beautifying care Lux soap facials give her skin. When a girl's as busy and as beautiful as Jane Wyatt, that's quite a tribute, Libby. And here's another way she depends on Lux toilet soap. She says a Lux soap bath gives her a quick beauty pickup. Leaves her refreshed after a tiring day. So many lovely women discovered that, Libby. Oh, yes, I know. There are several reasons why Lux soap makes a perfect bath soap, too. The lather is so rich and creamy. And women love the delicate, clinging fragrance it leaves on the skin. Well, Libby, you can't buy a finer soap than fragrant white Lux toilet soap. No wonder it's the choice of nine out of ten famous screen stars for daily beauty care. Now, here's your producer, William Keeley. 
It's time for the second act of Somewhere in the Night, starring John Hodiak as George Taylor and Lynn Barry as Christy. I didn't see Lieutenant Kendall till noon the next day. We had lunch in Christie's apartment. Kendall, Mel Phillips, and I. Wouldn't do for Kendall to know me as George Taylor, so... Well, this is the friend I called you about, Lieutenant. This is Tom Carter. How are you, Carter? Lieutenant? I've been wondering what's strange about you, Lieutenant. Strange? You've got your hat off. It's hard for me to believe you're a detective. You know, it's almost impossible to make a pinch with your hat off. They just won't believe you. <laughs> well, that's the movies, I guess. Lieutenant, I was wondering if you could give Carter here some information. Well, I sure try. Well, uh, would you know anything about a fellow named Larry Cravat? Quite a bit. Would you? Uh, not a thing. Uh, the information isn't for me. A pal of mine asked me to look him up about a personal matter. This, uh, pal of yours, he, uh, knew Cravat pretty well? Well, he didn't say. Do you know where Cravat can be reached, Lieutenant? If we knew Miss Smith, we'd probably reach for him ourselves. No, he dropped out of sight quite a while ago. You know, all this is very interesting. Yesterday, an ex-Marine named George Taylor showed up at a bank with a letter from Cravat. Could, uh, Taylor have been your pal, Mr. Carter? Well, my pal's in Japan. Oh, well, this fellow Taylor acted like he didn't want any part of the police. Hasn't been back in his hotel room since. You said if you knew where Cravat is, you might reach for him yourselves. Could you tell us why? It's no secret. When Cravat disappeared, two million dollars disappeared with him. You didn't know about it, Mel? I never knew anybody could even count that high. All this talk of Cravat, but who was he? Yeah. Well, Cravat was a private detective. He got by investigating husbands that played golf in the rain. Wives who didn't come back from the public library till after midnight. Till somebody dumped two million clams right in his lap. Well, how does a thing like that happen? Well, started in Germany. And one of the Nazi hotshots saw the handwriting on the wall. He sent the two million over here. But before he could come after it, he got knocked off by one of the fellow members of the Brotherhood. So here's this big chunk of dough floating around loose. It moved east to west. Each time, left a corpse behind. Boys play rough for that kind of lettuce, you understand? Somehow, the money got here to Los Angeles. Cravat got mixed up with it. I don't know much more, except when Cravat disappeared, so did the cash. Well, how does this other fella tie in with it? The one at the bank yesterday? Taylor? Hmm. I don't know. I should think you'd have picked him up by now. You must have a description. <laughs> Those eyewitness descriptions. <laughs> no... Taylor will probably drop into headquarters himself one of these days. If not, we'll go out and find him. Say, this is sure some fried chicken, Miss Smith. Yeah. Kendall enjoyed the fried chicken, all right, but not half as much as he enjoyed watching me squirm. It didn't take brains to know he was onto me. After Kendall left, Christie's boss, Mel, had an idea. You know, anybody that dug up Cravat would be digging up a couple of million with him. Well, I can have it. Yeah, maybe we can work something out. You wind up with Cravat, and I wind up with what I can get. And I wind up with a pair of nylons, if I'm lucky. You name it, Chris. All or any part of what I've got. Now, how about telling me what happened last night? Well, you might inquire about a character named Anselmo. Anselmo? A very polite man with a very wet face. He shut his eyes every time Hubert hit me. Suppose we run over to the cellar now. Maybe one of the hired hands would have a lead on him. Okay, Christy. Anything's better than washing dishes. I'm ready if you are. I better take your car, too, Chris. I... Well, well. Well, well, what? Is that a ticket on your windshield? A ticket? After feeding a cop lunch? No, it's not a ticket. It's a note. L.C. 4211 and a half North Summit, San Pedro. I... I don't get it. L.C. could stand for Larry Cravat. Isn't that a little childish for a detective leaving notes around like Easter eggs? What makes you so sure Kendall left it? Who else? Who else, Taylor? I've gotten beyond caring. But it means just one thing. I'm going to North Summit Street. I'll go with you. No. No, thanks. Things just don't happen like this, you know. It's too pat. Probably, but what do you want me to do? Look, just phone me. I'll be at the cellar at 6 o'clock. Here, car keys. Take my car. Oh, thanks, Christy. You're not going to worry now. With four brand new tires? Certainly I'll worry. Uh, tough guy. Okay, I'll call you. <laughs> I found the address in San Pedro. The man who came to the door wasn't happy. I disturbed him. He got more unhappy when I tried to pump him about Cravat. 
He seemed ready to start swinging when she appeared, Phyllis. Phyllis, who'd been looking for Uncle Larry in a Martin Hotel. What's he trying to sell you, sir? You wouldn't know, would you? You never seen him before, of course. I came here looking for a cravat. Cravat? Well, whoever he is, look someplace else. Yeah, look someplace else, see? Maybe your wife could suggest where. Why don't you try a fortune teller? Anyone in particular? No, cut it out. Maybe there is one in particular. Right next to Terminal Dock. Thanks. But if you can't find him, go to the dock and jump off. She couldn't have been serious about the fortune teller, but I had nothing else to do, so I wandered over to the dock. It was quite a shock seeing the sign on that broken-down old building. The Oracle, past, present, and future, told by the stars. One flight up. I got shock number two when the Oracle turned out to be Anselmo. I assure you, Mr. Taylor, I'm just as surprised to see you. Where is Hubert? He's close by. (laughs) But you have my word he will not molest you. Except my word is worthless. What are you doing here? Phyllis sent me. Phyllis? Oh, yes. She used to be my assistant when I was doing seances. That beating last night, Mr. Taylor, I wish with all my heart I could take it back. You haven't got a heart. True, but I've got a brain. And it was stupid of me. I apologize. What can I buy here? Palm reading? Horoscope? Let us use cards, Mr. Taylor. And place them face up on the table. Go ahead. Let me start by saying that I'm nothing more than a small-time chiseler. I say this bitterly because I do not wish to be small-time. Still, it's better than being honest, which I find intolerable. Three years ago, I had the chance of a lifetime, Mr. Taylor. I had... Name a fantastic sum of money. Two million dollars. You have put one of your cards alongside of mine. Thank you. As my hands closed on it, the two million dollars disappeared like that. And with it, Mr. Cravat. Yesterday, that chance revived. I entered the scene. I learned of you from a Turkish bath, from a nightclub. I approached you. You wouldn't say why you were looking for Cravat, not even where he was. I had to make you understand there was nothing I would not do to find him. I understood it the second time I passed out, but I can't help you, Anselmo. That I do not believe. You cannot be without some contact, some connection. And, uh, supposing I could reach Cravat? Ah. What would the message be? The message would... Phyllis, darling... You look like a couple of witches. What cooks? How thoughtful of you, Phyllis, to send Mr. Taylor to me. Oh, stop talking like Bela Lugosi. How did you know where to find me, Mr. Taylor? I got a note that said Larry Cravat was at 4211 and a half North Summit. From whom was the note? I don't know. Why would anybody want to tie me in with Cravat? I can think of someone with every reason in the world. Larry Cravat himself. I was about to give Mr. Taylor a message for him. Well, then you do know where he is. Why, you... I said listen! Tell Mr. Cravat two million dollars is of no use to a man in the electric chair. Suppose he doesn't understand what you mean. He will. Mr. Cravat is wanted by the police for a murder, which are caught on that dock out there three years ago. The murdered man was a Mr. Steele. The police have evidence that Cravat and another man were on the dock that night. What other man? Never mind. But for a considerable amount of money, I will turn him over to the police. He will confess to the murder and Cravat will go free. Well, this other man... If he's reluctant to confess, the police will find a suicide and a signed confession. That might be better in any case. And why would Cravat go for a phony deal like that? Because it is to his advantage. Yours too. Why mine? Mr. Cravat deposited $5,000 to your bank account. Why? He was not a charitable man. More than likely he was paying you for your services rendered. What were those services, Mr. Taylor? Is it not possible that the gentleman with cravat that night was you? Yeah. It's possible. I don't believe it was you. But the police may not agree. Mr. Taylor, does the name Conroy mean anything to you? Nothing. I wish I were really as psychic as I make out of my advertising. It would be most helpful to know when you are lying. Conroy, what about him? There is a man who might tell us much, except he's an inmate of a sanitarium. 
The day after Mr. Steele's murder, Mr. Conroy had the misfortune to be hit by a truck. The shock left him without a mind. I believe he... <laughs> Hello, Chris. I'm sorry I'm late. Did I miss your song again? Don't tell me you really care, Mel. You know I care. I've been with Kendall. Oh? He wants to help, Chris. So do I. What kind of trouble is Taylor in? It won't make any difference to me. Maybe it will, because it's murder. He telephoned a little while ago. Cravat was mixed up in it, and George thinks maybe he was, too. Thinks? Doesn't he know? He has no way of knowing. Oh, now, wait a minute. Believe me, he hasn't. Where is he now? He heard about a witness to the murder, a man named Conroy, who used to work on Terminal Dock. Conroy? George is seeing his daughter now. Why? To get some answers to some questions. It makes sense to me. Well, not to me. Taylor doesn't make much sense to me. Taking a beating to find somebody he doesn't know, running down a three-year-old murder? Chris, who is he? What's his angle? Where do you stand? Like always, my two feet firmly planted in midair. Don't get involved, Chris. You could get hurt. Hurt? <laughs> I'm the girl with a cauliflower heart. What's wrong with taking some good advice? Well, in this case, just one thing. I'm nuts about the guy. Say, I wonder if this Conroy girl's a red. So I came to inquire about your father, Miss Conroy. I would have called before, but I've been in the service overseas. He's better, thank you. The doctors keep telling me so, but it's been so long now. How long? Well, ever since his accident. Oh, I keep forgetting. You've been at war. He was hit by a truck. He, he's been there ever since. Been where? Lambeth Sanatorium. Well, I know you don't want to talk about it, if but... If you were a friend of his, you should know. Father had been reading the paper that morning before he went to work. A man had been murdered. I thought it was very odd. He seemed so elated. There was someone, he said, who'd make us very rich. Who, Miss Conroy? Who'd make you rich? I don't remember. Was it Larry Cravat? I I don't remember things well, really. Well, you, you said Lambeth Sanitarium. You're going there? Well, I'd like to see your father. Oh, no visitors. They don't allow visitors. <laughs> Poor thing, worried and lonely. As I walked from the house, I could feel her eyes staring at me. I turned and waved to her, and I stepped off the curb to get into the car. Mr. Taylor! Mr. Taylor! I'm okay, Miss Conroy. I'm okay. It was no coincidence. The truck had tried to run me down, and it would have if she hadn't screamed. I had plenty to think about as I drove to Lambeth Sanitarium, wondering if her father would prove just half as helpful. How dare you wander about the corridors of this sanatorium by yourself? Well, the door was open. That's not true, Doctor. He said he wanted to see 214. I distinctly told him that was impossible. How is it the door to this corridor was not locked, Miss Meyer? It was locked. Well, I had to leave the reception room for a moment. He must have used the buzzer on my desk that opens the door. But what about Conroy? Why can't he have visitors? Because his condition does not warrant it. Well, I'm his nephew. I've a right... You're to... not his nephew. If you knew Michael Conroy at all, you'd know that for the past three years he's been insane. Now get out of here. I waited outside the gates, wondering how to get back in. It was dark now, and that would have helped, but not so dark that I couldn't see him. A man. A man who swung open an iron grill, barring a window on the ground floor. I caught a glimpse of his face as he ran past a lamp. He wore glasses. One more character in the maddening procession. But whoever he was, he'd left the iron grill open. A few minutes later, I was in Conroy's room. Conroy was on the floor, a knife in his back. That truck. I didn't see it. It came out of nowhere. Conroy, who did it? Who was just in here? Just hit me and kept on going. My back. It hurts. It hurts. That night on the dock, Conroy, a man was murdered. Yes, I saw it. Who did it? Was it Larry Cravat? The man was dead, and there was a, a, a suitcase. He dropped it. Who dropped it? One of the men who ran away. Larry Cravat? I hid it under, uh, under the dock up in the pilings. Nobody ever goes there. He, he'd have to pay me for it. I'd be rich. Which one was Cravat? The one with the suitcase? Did he do the shooting? Who? Who 
Are you? Or was I the man with a suitcase? Did I do the shooting? You? Elizabeth, my daughter, she... Conroy! Well, back the same night, huh? Christy, can I talk to you for a minute? Well, it's pretty late, isn't it? Come in. Oh, your car, it's in the driveway. Thanks. I fixed some sandwiches. They're all dried out by now, but if you're hungry, you I... You waited up for me. Well, I just thought that... Oh, sit down. Oh, it's no good, Chris. I've got to get out of town. Now, this minute? This minute? I found Conroy in a sanitarium. He'd been knifed. He died in my arms. On my way out, I had a little trouble with a doctor. I had to hit him. Why didn't you stay and tell the truth? With a dead man in my arms? It was the truth, wasn't it? Why run away? Because I live by running away. Conroy couldn't tell you anything? Plenty. All about a suitcase hidden under terminal dock. What about cravat? Well, it could have been a couple of other fellas. And it could have been you. Isn't that what you told me Anselmo said? Why don't you say it, too? That's what you're thinking? I don't know what I'm thinking. You were running away the night you ran into my life. A man was killed because you asked him some questions. You were beaten up. You wanted to run again. All you knew about yourself was a mysterious letter found in a wallet. Then you... Who's that? Better find out, hadn't I? Get in the next room. Whoever it is, I'll try to keep him in the doorway. Who is it? Lieutenant Candle, Miss Smith. I uh, came for George Taylor. Oh, you must be a little mixed up, Lieutenant. This is where I live. Look, Christine. Is Taylor here? They're both inside. He and Adolf Hitler. They'll promote you for this, Lieutenant. Yeah, yeah that's a good one. But I gotta find him. See, it looks like he killed a man tonight, a man named Conroy. Well, sure glad he isn't here. That way you'd be mixed up in it, you know? Yes, I know. Well, if you should see him, tell him I'll be down at the station for a couple of hours yet, eh? If I see him... Oh, uh, one more thing. You ought to keep your car in the garage, Christy. Isn't good to leave it out all night like that. With the motor so hot. I was coming out when he stopped me by talking about you. He knows, George. He knows everything. Two hours. That's not much time. Or is it? It's enough. Turn out the lights while I get my coat. Where are we going? To San Pedro. To look for a suitcase under Terminal Dock. We pause now for station identification. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. In a moment, we'll return with the third act of Somewhere in the Night, starring John Hodiak and Lynn Barry. Our guest tonight is Miss Ruth Roman, a successful authoress as well as a Paramount starlet. Is that so, Ruth? Well, I've written and sold two short stories, Mr. Keeley, but I guess my real ambition is pictures. I was delighted when my screen test brought me a Paramount contract. Delighted, but not surprised, I'll wager. Even modesty can't prevent a girl from knowing that coloring like yours is unusual. Mind if I tell our audience? Not at all, Mr. Keeley. Hair of a rich bronze <laughs> shade, brown eyes, creamy skin. You know, I hope there's a technicolor part in the offering for you. Thank you, Mr. Keeley. But when it really comes to striking coloring, I nominate Paulette Goddard. I've always admired her. So what a thrill it was to visit her on the set when she was making her picture, Suddenly It's Spring. Oh, that's the new Paramount picture where she stars with Fred McMurray. Yes. It's a romantic comedy drama the kind both stars do so well. Miss Goddard showed me sketches of the different hairdo she was to wear, and suddenly it's spring. Oh, my, she can wear her hair just about any way and look stunning. Yes, Paulette is a real glamour girl, all right, and a real luxe girl, too. Well, that's what I found out, Mr. Kennedy, and I don't want you to change your mind about my being modest, but uh, I'll tell you how Miss Goddard complimented me and my complexion. And then we discovered we're both devoted to the same beauty soap. She told me her luxe soap facials are a daily routine. She never neglects. And I'll bet you never do either, Miss Roman. <laughs> now, wouldn't it be silly for a girl in pictures to take chances with complexion care? Especially when Lux soap facials are so quick and easy. Won't you tell us how you take an active lather facial? Well, here's all I do. Smooth on lots of the rich Lux soap lather and work it well in. Rinse with warm water, then cold. Pat my face dry with a soft towel. 
It certainly leaves skin feeling beautifully smooth. Thank you, Miss Ruth Roman. Lux Soap Care makes skin lovelier, as actual tests prove. Skin specialists have made tests that showed improvement in three out of four cases. So, if you haven't tried this fragrant white soap, why not begin tomorrow? Remember, Lux Toilet Soap is Hollywood's own beauty soap. Here's Mr. Keeley at the microphone. Our curtain rises on Act Three of Somewhere in the Night, starring John Hodiak as George and Lynn Barry as Christy. It was black and lonely that night at Terminal Dock. Somewhere far off, there might have been a watchman down where the lights of a rescue mission were faintly glowing. But there was no place to bring a girl. Not a girl you cared about. Well, we made our way under the pilings, hoping our flashlights would hold out. It's not as bad as I thought of it. Oh! Watch it, Christy. You hurt? It's just my shin. What's under here anyway? What the ocean throws back. And two million dollars, I hope. Christy? Yes? I should never have let you come down here. Look, take the car and go home. I'm scared but I'd be more scared leaving you here by yourself. Be sensible. You don't know who I am. You don't know what I may have done. If it turns out that in your whole life you ever killed anything bigger than a horsefly, then I'm crazy. Now, how about finding that suitcase? Okay. If I were hiding a suitcase under here, I'd put it up as high as I could. Well, if it's here at all, it's bound to be in this area. These are the only pilings. Those others are concrete pillars. Yes, I think we should stay very close together. Come back. What's that over there? No. It's just a beam. It isn't a beam. Look, it's... a suitcase. It is, isn't it? There's something wedged up there, all right. Chris, that's it. It might not be the right suitcase, but it's a suitcase. Open it up. It looks as though someone's been at it. Give me the flashlight. Rats, probably. There are some things I'd rather not know, if you don't mind. Thousand dollar bills. And a man's suit. Bring your flashlight closer, I, I think. Yeah, there's a label in the coat. Tailored for Larry Cravat. Los Angeles, December 1942. Yeah, look at this other label. Made by W. George Taylor. W. George. Ta- George Taylor. What are you talking about? I- George Taylor. Meet Larry Cravat. Larry Cravat, meet George Taylor. I don't have to try the suit on, Chris. It would fit. Don't you see? There's a murder. A man changes his clothes. He changes his name. He hides out. With a brand new war on, what better place for me to hide than in the service? This doesn't prove anything, you know. No? Let me close the suitcase. We're getting out of here. If my mind had not been on what I just discovered, maybe I would have had sense enough to guess we might have been watched as it was. Drop your flashlight, duck! George! Get away from me and run! Right here! The rescue mission! Hurry, Christy, hurry! Rescue mission? Oh, that's no gag, is it? Whoever was shooting may follow us in here. I don't think so, but he may. I've still got the suitcase. Good evening. Oh, good evening. Is is it all right if we stay here a while? Of course. Well, you... You see, we... We were... We don't ask people why they come to the mission, my boy. There's some coffee back there, if you care to have any. Who was he? Mission superintendent. You sure? No, I'm sure of nothing. Only of who I am. Larry Cravat. George, try to remember. Try. I'm Cravat. I had a tailor named George. I also remember a letter from a girl you knew, Mary. Mary wrote that letter to Larry Cravat. I didn't know him, but I know you. As far as I'm concerned, you're George Taylor. I killed a man on that dock three years ago. I don't know who he was, but I killed him. Dropped this suitcase and ran away. The other man could have killed him. There were two. Do you really think you could have ever killed anybody? I know about George Taylor, no. But I can't speak for Cravat. I can, and the answer is no. Suppose a man's memory is gone. His brain's the same. His his sense of right and wrong's the same. You didn't think much of him. What poor Mary wrote, she wrote on the spur of the moment. She was miserable. She was... Well, three years of war can change a man, can't they? You're making a nice try, Chris, but they'll say I did it. They'll say you killed Conroy, too. Did you? No. Don't make me try anymore, Chris. I'm not up to it. 
We can't stay here much longer. Lieutenant Kendall won't mind waiting a while. Now, look. Everything that happened to you happened because someone thought you could lead him to Larry Cravat. Why? The money, of course. And Zelmo told you that Cravat was the murderer. He said so because he wanted to make a deal. For some of the money, he'd clear Cravat. Well, sure. But if I'm the only contact with the $2 million, they'd certainly want to keep me alive. Yet twice today, somebody's tried to kill me. Because you were getting close to something more important than the money. You were getting close to whoever murdered that man on the dock. That's why Conroy was killed. Yeah. But they had to kill Conroy. They couldn't take a chance. They sacrificed the money to shut his mouth for good. And the way it turned out, they brought the poor guy to his senses long enough for him to tell... What are we going to do about it, George? We're going to trade in Larry Cravat for a murderer. Come on. Leaving so soon? Well, I wonder if you could do me a favor. Yes. This suitcase, could you have someone deliver this right away to police headquarters? Police? Yes, it belongs to Detective Lieutenant Kendall. He's the one with his hat off. I know Lieutenant Kendall, young lady. I'd be glad to run it over myself. I'd like to leave a little donation. Ten dollars. Thank you. Thank you very much. Chris, how long do you think before you can forget the guy that Mary wrote about in her letter? Funny you should bring that up. I forgot about him long ago. I just keep remembering what it must have been that she was in love with. Now, where are we going? To a fortune teller. I've got some checking to do with Anselmo. Phyllis and Hubert were with him when we reached Anselmo's. The oracle was his customary pleasant self. The radio says you're wanted for murder, Mr. Taylor. That's not news. Pull up a chair, Christy. It is therefore necessary to conclude our business at once. Mr. Taylor, where is Larry Cravat? Shouldn't that be, Mr. Cravat, where is George Taylor? What? You wanted Cravat? All right, you're looking at it. You're crazy. I had my face pushed around at Iwo Jima, Phyllis. The docs patched me up. Well? Well, it could be him, I guess. After all, I only met him once three years ago. Look, if he's Cravat, then he knows where it is. Don't let him waste no more time, boss. He'll talk. Well, what do you know? Hubert said three whole sentences. Hello, Chris. Mel. Hello, George. Excuse me, but I don't believe I've had the pleasure. The name is Phillips, Mr. Anselmo. And your name must be Phyllis. I've heard about you, too. And Hubert. Phyllis is a well-known society girl. I called you when I heard the news on the radio, Chris. Been all over town looking for you. Good thing you mentioned Anselmo, George. Could it be that you came for an edit reason, Mr. Phillips? Could be. I think of myself as an important stockholder in $2 million. Are you going to stand for this? Perhaps. Before any more partners arrive, I suggest you continue what you were saying, Mr. Cravat. Well, and... Cravat? Yes, we'll tell you later. I'll take the proposition you offered me, Anselmo, with one slight change. I don't want a fall guy. One of you, or someone you know, killed Steele on that dock. I want the one that really did it. You still maintain that you yourself were not the one. I know it. In that case, I cannot tell you how sorry I am, Phyllis. Sorry? For what? That you killed Mr. Steele. That I can protect you no longer. Oh, you big tubalard. Baby here don't get framed by your kind. You try to put that on me and there's a dead bartender the cops want to know about. Suppose we leave the cannibals to devour each other, Chris. It's okay with me, George. But I still don't know who killed Steele. Don't you think it's time we let Lieutenant Kendall in on this? Well, maybe you're right. So long, Anselmo. Hubert, they think they're leaving us. Relax, Hubert. Whenever I go hunting, I always carry a gun. I see. And now you're going to the cops. What do you think? I think I shall not even have time to get out of town. Better pack my things, Hubert. The cellar was on our way to police headquarters. Mel suggested we stop there for a drink. The place was closed that time of night, so Mel fixed us a highball himself. The only reason I own nightclubs is so that I can get a drink after hours. Well, so you're a cravat, are you, George? Yes. Excuse the frankness, but I think you've been acting like an idiot. The prize was walking into that setup at Anselmo's. It was a chance he had to take. It wasn't a chance. That was suicide. If I hadn't come... I owe you plenty, Mel. You owe me nothing. What I did, I did for Christy. You see, I figured that all of them wanted the money except one. Oh? Yes. Someone wants me dead even more than he wants two million dollars. Why? Because if and when I get my memory back, I'll know who killed Steele. But I figured he'd make some move. Anselmo, Hubert, or the fellow who killed Conroy in case he showed up, too. 
I figured he'd try to get me alone, even to get me out of there. Yes, he had to get you alone, didn't he? Away from the others so he wouldn't show his hand. So they wouldn't know that he... Mel. Mel, what are you... I always knew you were a smart girl, Chris. Take it easy, George. I've still got that gun. I'm sorry you're in this, Chris. You've guessed right. She's not in it. You knew all along that George was Larry Cravat. No, not until tonight. I'd never met Cravat. Steele had come east to bring me the money. I'm in a good spot to slip big bills like that into circulation. We were to meet on the dock. Somehow Cravat got word of it. He met Steele, convinced him he was me, and got the cash. Steele was alone when I got there. I thought he double-crossed me. He thought I'd pulled a phony. He started to make trouble, and I... I killed him. Then I saw Cravat. I shot once and missed. I never saw him again. Conroy saw it, and you tried to kill him with a truck. The same thing you tried with me tonight. Conroy doesn't worry me anymore. No, the little man with the glasses took care of that, didn't he? Did you send him after us tonight at the dock? I never knew you were under the dock. His orders were to get you wherever and whenever. I've thought about you a lot, Cravat. And the money you stole from me. You're going to be a poor man now. A dead man's a poor man. I got you into this, George. Little Miss Know the Right People. I had to call in this good, sweet character. Why didn't you stay out of it? I warned you, Christy. The same answer still goes. Yeah, I know. You're nuts about the guy. She's got no part of this, and you know it. It's too late. You're both in my way. Maybe it isn't too late. What about the money? We found it tonight under the dock. Every brand new thousand dollar bill. I'll make a deal. Christie's life for two million dollars. Sorry, no sale. Well, what could she do with a smart operator like you? Go to the police? It's her word against yours. It's no use, George, and I won't have Two million dollars, Phillips. Two million dollars. Where is it? I'll take you near it. Then Christie goes free and I'll take you to it. Where do we have to go? Back near the dock. It's still in the suitcase. Come on, then. Let's go. I told him we were close when we got near the rescue mission again. I was at the wheel. He couldn't drive, not with a gun in his hand. I stopped the car and we all got out. Mel took a look around. All right, I'll get back in the car. You've told me what I wanted to know. But you don't know where the money is. The mission, of course. What better place? Well, what about Christy? She's going to be poor, too, like you. You won't get the money. Not now, I won't. I'll be back for it later. Get in the car, both of you. Drive on the dock. Don't anybody move. It's Kendall. Oh, there we are, Cravat. You too, Miss Smith. What's it look like, Max? It's Phillips, all right, Lieutenant. He's still with us. Uh, hey, uh, keep those people back there. Right, come on, get back. Well, way back. Move back. Yeah, better call an ambulance. Yes. Okay, Cravat. Yes, you and Miss Smith can come along with me now. Phillips, tell you what you wanted to know, Lieutenant? Yeah, with the full details. Make better reading than Forever Amber. And will he live? As if I care. Well, if I could only learn to shoot straight, maybe I could save you taxpayers some dough, but I always close my eyes. It's for you, Lieutenant. Oh. Ah. Peterson. Yeah. Hello, Pete. Oh, a little man with the glasses. Used to work as an orderly at the Lambeth Sanatorium. Yeah, you can start from there. You got Anselmo and the others? That's good. Okay, I'll see you. You know, Cravat, that was a pretty sharp hunk of thinking you did. Bringing Phillips back to the mission. You know I'd backtrack in the suitcase, didn't you? Well, the spot we were in, I had to think sharp and talk fast. Yeah. You must have been a pretty fair shamus, Cravat. Shamus? Shamus is a private detective. Yeah. Think you'd go back to it? No, thanks. You see, three years of war can change a man. That's what I always say. Well, if I can be of any help to you, just let me know. Well, I'd sure like some answers to a lot of questions. I know the answer to one lieutenant, but he hasn't asked me yet. Oh, why don't you just talk it over out there in the hall? Uh, who might argue with a cop? <laughs> you know, Moskowitz, you ever wondered why a detective keeps his hat on all the time? No, I can't say I ever thought about it, Lieutenant. I found out why tonight. You see, if you have to shoot a man, you don't want to be holding a hat in your hand. <laughs> I guess the movies are right after all. <laughs> In just a moment, our stars will be back for a curtain call. We hope you'll join us. Meanwhile, have you had an experience like this lately? Now, let's see, Mrs. Brown. Uh, the groceries are $2 even. But I owe you 30 cents for that used fat you brought in, so... 
Here's your 30 cents change. It's a nice feeling to be able to save 30 cents on your meat bill, especially these days. And you can save like this frequently because dealers are now paying substantially more per pound for your used kitchen fats. Besides the saving in cash, housewives are doing a real service by saving and turning in used fats. The world's supply of industrial fats is still very short. Fats and oils are urgently needed in the manufacture of the industrial products so necessary to a smooth-running household. Refrigerators, washing machines, automobile tires, and soap are some of these items. So pour every drop of used kitchen fats into the salvage tin. Take it to your dealer promptly and receive a generous price for all you turn in. Back now to your producer, William Keeley. Two such superb performances are deserving of a curtain call. And here are tonight's stars making their real-life appearance at our footlights. John Hodiak and Lynn Barry. John, I'm sure our listeners in Pennsylvania are proud of you. Do you come from Pennsylvania, John? Well, I was born there, but raised in a little town in Michigan. Where, I understand, you were a baseball prodigy. Well, as a matter of fact, John had to choose between professional baseball and the screen as a career. Is that right, John? Well, uh, we used to play a lot of sandlot baseball, Mr. Keeley. I remember once I was a sort of a hero of the gang. What happened? Well, one of our opposing batters hit a ball to me in left field. The longest hit I ever saw. And you made a shoestring catch, eh? No, but I found the ball two days later. <laughs> How did that make you a hero? It was the only ball we had. Oh. <laughs> you know, I used to play baseball, John. You, Lynn? Yes, when I was a kid, we had a softball team. Well, say, we should have gotten our teams together, played a doubleheader. Two games? Sure. First one, baseball. Second one, post office. <laughs> well, I can see how that idea would have had plenty of support from your teammates, John I'm sure that even in her baseball playing days, Lynn was most attractive with that glamorous complexion Well, even then I was using Lux Soap, Bill And I've never stopped depending on it It's a wonderful complexion care And it's nice of you to say so, Lynn What do you have on deck next Monday night, Bill? Next Monday night, we bring our audience one of the screen's outstanding hits A picture that's been nominated for the Academy Awards Liberty Films' inspiring production, It's a Wonderful Life. And we present it with its original fine stars, Jimmy Stewart and Donna Reed. That's Jimmy's also first... Also, J. Carroll Nash. That's Jimmy's first role, isn't it, Bill, since returning to the screen? And the role that has him nominated for the best performance of the year. Yes, a great cast and a story close to all our hearts. A drama of small-town life and lovable people who move you to tears and sympathy and laughter. It's a Wonderful Life is just what its name implies, enjoyable, enriching entertainment. That play should pack them in from coast to coast, Bill. Congratulations and good night. Good night, good night and thanks from all of us. <laughs> Lever Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday evening when the Lux Radio Theater presents Jimmy Stewart, Donna Reed, and J. Carroll Nash in It's a Wonderful Life. This is William Keeley saying good night to you from Hollywood. John Hodiak appeared by arrangement with Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, producers of the human story behind the atom bomb, The Beginning or the End. Heard in our cast tonight were Carlton Cadell as Mel, John Blyfer as Anselmo, Carol Smith as Phyllis, Bill Johnstone as Kendall, and Ed Emerson, Norman Field, Charles Seal, Eddie Marr, Alex Gary, Margaret Muse, Yuki Sharon, and Alan Lockwood. Our music was directed by Louis Silvers. This program is broadcast to our men and women overseas through cooperation with the Armed Forces Radio Service. And this is your announcer, John Milton Kennedy, reminding you to tune in again next Monday night to hear It's a Wonderful Life with Jimmy Stewart, Donna Reed, and J. Carol Nash. Sprite. When you bake and fry, Sprite. pour your cake and pie, Sprite. get your shortening by, rely on Spry. Yes, it's Spry for pastry so tender, flaky, nut sweet, any pie filling tastes more delicious. You'll say pastry is extra delicate, better tasting with Spry. Rely on Spry. S-P-R-Y. Rely on Spry. S-P-R-Y. Be sure to listen in next Monday night to the Lux Radio Theater presentation of It's a Wonderful Life with Jimmy Stewart, Donna Reed, and J. Carol Nash. 
And why not tune in later tonight to hear the Joan Davis Show. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.